Dr. Snyder, thank you so much for making time for me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Zachary. And the first thing I'll ask, I've been asking all my guests lately because we're living through such a really interesting and in some ways unique moment in history. Uh, what has this quarantine period been like for you both personally and professionally in your work as a sex therapist? Okay, well, personally, true confessions, I'm a bit of a bookworm, as anybody who's read Shocking. my book will know, because, you know, I'm also a doctor. So I was the guy always in the library in college, you know, everybody else was hooking up. So um, it's paradoxical that I'm the person now giving sex <laughs> advice. But, uh, um, you know, I've been married 30 years, so I kind of know this, the, the landscape. Um, and mostly I write about sex and committed couples. So I figure, OK, I've got some authority there. Um, so it hasn't been that bad for me. I just basically stay inside, which is always what I wanted to do anyway. Um, and professionally, it's been interesting because I think we've gone back to, in a way, echoes of an earlier time. You know, the hookup culture really kind of got its start uh, uh, with Grindr and the other gay apps where people would hook up first. And then if you kind of sampled the goods and you liked the person, maybe in time you would have a relationship. Um, whereas traditionally, it had been the opposite. You have a relationship first and then you hook up. Um, so I think we're going a little bit back to the others. I talk to people these days who kind of may develop a connection with somebody on an app. They may go to uh, 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 voicemail or FaceTime or something like that. And then after a while, they may have a little bit of a get together social distancing. And then if they really like each other, they decide it's worth it and they can get each other's background and so forth. It's worth it to hook up. And you get really interesting results because you see some relationships that have blossomed in a much deeper way, which is really, really interesting. So I think we're getting a little flavor of how things used to be, uh, not terribly uh, all, all negative. That, that's fascinating. And I'm embarrassed to admit that I hadn't even considered that, that things could be shifting in that way as a result of this strange quarantine and the social distancing and all the rest. That's, that's absolutely yeah, the, fascinating. The, the initial encounter is often a, a verbal uh, and emotional encounter rather than a physical encounter, uh, as opposed to, uh, the, uh, you know, traditionally the last couple of decades where it's been physical first. And then if you like that, what you feel, then you may want to get to know the person. Interesting. So, I mean, you brought up Grindr and the hookup apps and stuff. I mean, we might yeah. as well just jump right into it. I mean, you're, yeah. you, you say you've been doing this for over 30 years, I, I gather, uh, working. Oh, as yeah, yeah, absolutely. And married for over 30 years, too. Congratulations on both fronts. That's true. No, that's I mean, how, how has your work changed as a result of Grindr and Tinder and hookup culture? And, you know, more generally, I know this is probably difficult to answer generally, but I mean, what is this doing to relationships in your view? I think the big change has been women's empowerment because uh, there's a theory in sexology that the females of most mammal species are more erotically flexible. So, um, women's culture does shift. And there was time when women were supposed to be kind of demure and coy and not as interested in sex. And you found many women kind of enacting what the social expectations were to be coy and demure. Charles Darwin wrote about this in the 19th century. And this was really the, the, the image for most of the early 20th century. And then things have shifted and women have become more financially independent and they've been become more socially independent. There are now more unmarried adult women in America than there are married women, adult women in America. It's the first time ever in history that that's happened. And so women have become more independent, more empowered, and um, things have shifted to where now women no longer are expected to act coy and shy. And they're expected to be able to act sexually adventurous. And they do. So women often will enact whatever social roles are current in the time. There's a lot of discussion as to which is truer to women's actual nature. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that, but um, you're seeing a real shift and women are acting more aggressive and men basically don't know what to do about it. I think that's the big picture. You know, the 20th century was the century of women's empowerment and women emerging as independent creatures, um, both socially and financially. And the 21st century, I think, is going to be men trying to figure out what to do with the fact that that's happened. We haven't quite figured out what to do with it yet. One way that this presents itself is that um, men now tend to feel much more responsible for their partner's erotic pleasure than they ever did before. 
men always liked it when they could go a long time and their female partner could have orgasms and so forth. But now men are really diligent about it. And that's created problems because all that diligence often is not so passive. Oh, sorry, is often is not so passionate. So a guy will say, yeah, I'm trying to do a good job, you know, so that she'll want to see me again, which historically wasn't exactly the case. And guys tend to be compulsive. So they're compulsive about working out. They're compulsive about looking good these days. And they're compulsive about being good sexual partners these days. And they want to, you know, do oral sex right. And they buy the books on how to do oral sex. And then they want to do this right and that right. And in the process, they lose kind of their animal nature. And they forget that when they hold a woman, I'm talking about straight guys, obviously, when they hold a woman, what she really wants is she doesn't want to know how good his technique is. She wants to know, is he really, really passionate about my body? Does he really passionately want me? Does he find me physically irresistible? And often the guy is doing all this stuff to try and do a good job. And in the process, that message doesn't get communicated. The message that he really wants her and that he's really ravenous for her body. Because that's often what most women I talk to say they really, really want to, to, to experience. So it gets all confused that way. The other way it gets confused is that historically in the 20th century, the big issue was women losing sexual desire. Women, you know, the, the term back then, it's a very archaic word these days, the term back then was frigidity. A woman was frigid. She wasn't responding sexually. She wasn't interested in sex. Not tonight, dear, I have a headache. That was the legend. Um, in the 21st century, I don't see that that much. You see some of it, but my phone rings off the hook all day long with the opposite situation now. A woman calls me and she says, my husband, my boyfriend, my partner have gone missing in bed. They're not there anymore. And that's the big epidemic in the 21st century is guys losing desire. So it's got to be connected somehow with all those other social changes. But I don't know exactly what's going on. In my book, I theorize that endlessly about it. But, um, and if you want, I'll tell you my pet theories about it. But that's the big phenomenon. Nobody knows exactly why it is. Guys are dropping like flies. That's remarkable. I mean, uh, and this provides a perfect segue into, again, a question I was planning to get to later, but we might as well bring it up now because I feel like it might be linked. Pornography. Uh -huh. Because yeah. when you describe this, my, I mean, I'm not a sex therapist, but my gut tells me, because I know I've interacted with many, many, many men who have a real problem with, you know, endlessly streaming, high definition pornography yeah. becomes an addiction and they're always looking for another hit and more violent and extreme and all the rest. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, what are your thoughts on pornography in, in the context of this discussion? Okay. Um, Pornography obviously has been a huge influence <clears throat> on male sexuality, to some extent female sexuality too, but on male sexuality in the 21st century. Um, the important thing to know about pornography is that it's all about camera angles. So things you see in porn are constructed that way because they provide good camera angles. So the most common position that lovers actually do in lovemaking is they embrace in one way or another, and the penis goes in the vagina, straight couples. And you don't see that very much in pornography. You don't see a lot of embracing. Instead, you see ritualized acting, which are designed to let the camera get in and show the penis and the vagina. And that's what it's all about. And so uh, it's a little ridiculous that way. Pornography has obviously raised the bar in terms of uh, sexual novelty. In during World War II, most uh, uh, allied fighting men and presumably the, the enemy fighting men as well would masturbate to pictures of women in bathing suits, just still posters and pictures of pinup girls in bathing suits. And guys could do that. There's very few guys in the 21st century who can still do that, who can still masturbate to uh, pictures in bathing suits. Um, so first there were still images of naked women. And now the videos, um, I've had patients who've been uh, addicted to prostitutes who no longer have to see prostitutes because the videos are so good. They say, you know, that the lighting and everything and the, the, the models and everything, they're so good. I don't have to see prostitutes anymore. This is really pretty good stuff. So it's become to where it uh, does supply a lot of the, uh, a lot of the ingredients. So the uh, way pornography, uh, works is it does have to up the ante of novelty. 
So these days you go on Pornhub and half of the images that you see, the thumbnail images are stepbrother, does stepsister and so forth, you know, so it's gotten fairly into the ridiculous and guys know that, but they still go for it um, because, you know, they got to keep that novelty going to get enough dopamine or whatever it is into their heads. So where it tend to affect couples is a guy's doing porn usually when his partner is asleep or when she's out of the house, speaking of, uh, you know, straight guys. And so sex is a little like Pavlov's dog. Whatever you associate to it by proximity will become part of your sexual image. So Pavlov fed his dog and every time he fed his dog, he rang the bell. So the dog's not stupid. The dog goes bell, food. Every time you ring the bell, the dog's gonna get hungry. It's the same thing with porn. Every time you masturbate, it's because your partner has fallen asleep or left the house. Partner leaves the house, partner falls asleep, that's the bell. It goes, hey, let's do some porn. The contrary of that is that when uh, your partner wakes up or comes back in the house, you hear her key in the door, that's a signal to turn off the porn. So her presence becomes a negative sexual signal. And you see that deep Pavlov association, and it is a factor in guys these days going missing in bed. So I always tell guys, bring more of your orgasms to bed with your partner than you do to porn, and that way the Pavlov's dog bell will be ringing, at least to some extent, with the scent of your partner and the smell of the sheets and the bedroom and so forth, rather than her falling asleep and leaving the house. That's absolutely fascinating. And again, I, I can't believe that I never considered the Pavlovian connection that you're describing there because it makes so much sense. That's Sex so is strongly Pavlovian. They do experiments in rats where they take the male rat and he's only allowed to, make, to mount the female rat if he's wearing a little yellow jacket. <laughs> and after a while in this experiment, you bring the female rat in the cage and the, guy, the rat is not wearing the yellow jacket. He's not going to mount the female rat because of the Pavlov's dog conditioning. He goes, where's my jacket? I can't do it without my jacket. Wow. Do you, yeah. have, do you have any other theories on why men are checking out in relationships? I mean, I find that so, so interesting. Like, why is this, why is this happening? Do you, have, do you have any other thoughts on why this might be happening? There's a deeper reason, which is that men don't want to disappoint women. And especially now when women are empowered, women didn't used to be empowered. A uh, woman, you know, hundred years ago, they barely had the right to vote. Um, but these days women are empowered. And so men know that they are two equal partners in a relationship. And um, they get very stressed when they see a woman disappointed. Men do not want to see women disappointed. It's a very primal thing. You know, you look at the old, old Playboy magazine centerfolds. I don't know if you're old enough to have ever seen one. I am. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, you'd, you'd open Playboy magazine back in the old days if you're a guy, and you'd open to the centerfold, and you'd pull it out, and here's what you saw. Here were the, the secret sauce. Woman with a rockin' hot body, obviously, and hair, makeup, lighting, perfect. It's all perfect. And then... The cherry on top was she had this enormous smile, which was this big welcoming smile that said, oh, it's you, it's you. I'm so happy to see you. Thank God you bought this magazine. Come on in. <laughs> so that smile is the classic invitation. Men really usually need that smile in order to be totally comfortable. So, uh, the woman gives them that pleased smile that says they're happy with them. Now, the opposite, the woman is upset with them. They're discouraged, frustrated with them. He's done something to hurt her feelings or he hasn't uh, done something that she wanted or whatever, and she's upset. It happens. It happens in any relationship. The guy gets very, very stressed. He doesn't want to initiate sex with somebody who's not smiling at him. Instead, what he does is he usually withdraws because guys don't want to feel uh, like they've disappointed a woman. So they'll withdraw. It's the equivalent in, that women always complain about that guys ghost them uh, on these apps or on text. And the reason the guy ghosts the woman is he doesn't want to see her anymore, but he can't tell her because he doesn't want to experience her being disappointed. Um, which you really have to coach a guy. I do this in the office all the time. You say, look, I really like you, but I don't think we're going to make it as a couple. I don't think it's, we're going to work out between us. I'm really sorry. And she goes, oh, thank God you told me. I don't have to, have to sit home at night wondering when you're going to text me again. 
Um, because women are very, very sensitive to abandonment by and large. Men are too, but women, it's a big thing. And men are very sensitive to feeling shamed. Um, so women are too, but it's, it, for men, it's a big thing. So uh, the man feels kind of shamed because he disappointed the woman. So he withdraws. And if they're in a partnership together, she gets even more upset because he's withdrawn, which is the one thing that most women absolutely can't stand. And so she gets even more upset. Now he feels really shamed. Now he really withdraws. And then the whole thing goes to hell. So it's a vicious cycle. And often the prime event when a man's gone missing in bed is that he's experienced her being upset or disappointed with him. And he didn't know how to deal with it. He didn't know how to handle it with it. So he withdrew and she got more upset. And he began to associate her in a Pavlovian sense as somebody who was negative. And there's another aspect, which is a little deeper for guys, which is most guys don't really do intimate relationships really well, where there are cycles of rupture and repair and, you know, being upset and then making up and so forth. Um, most guy male friendships don't have that intense, intimate aspect. Most female friendships do. So since she was 11 years old with her best friends, if not earlier, She's constantly going through, I thought you were upset with me. Here's why. Here's why I really wasn't upset with you. Here's why. I, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to work this out? Okay, we're friends now. I'm so glad we talked about this. Guys aren't doing that. So she's got decades of experience with rupture and repair. He doesn't. He doesn't have any experience usually with rupture and repair. Usually, I'm stretching a little bit, but usually his last real profound experience of a real intimate relationship was with his mother. And guys separate from their mothers ordinarily in order to learn the male role and to take on the male identity. They have to kind of distance themselves a little bit. Straight guys have to kind of distance themselves from their, little, from their mothers at the age of three or four or five in order to be kind of fully like, I, you know, I don't like you to kiss and hug me. I'm a, I'm a boy. I'm a man, you know, that kind of thing. And so they had that early intimate relationship. And it's kind of gone for all these years. And now he's 30 years old and he sees a woman disappointed with him. He has no idea. He doesn't have the tools to handle it. He hasn't any experience. So he cuts and runs um, or he goes missing in bed or whatever. Um, and the early experience of seeing mother unhappy with you is usually leaves a very big mark on a man. So there were times when mother was happy with him and there were times when she was unhappy with him. And the times when she was happy with him that gets revived in an erotic adult situation because it's an early sign that everything is right with the universe. Mother is happy with me. And as you read about when you read my book, sexuality is infantile to begin with because um, there's all that fusion of emotion and phys physicality that you don't really get after about the age of three or four or five. And so uh, you get that kind of uh, fusion of two people, you know, there's two company, three's a crowd or breastfeeding, all that early stuff, which is just so uh, intense. And when you, as a teenager, you discover eroticism and sexuality, it feeds off all those early, early images, all those early, early feelings. And there is a quality of, oh yeah, yeah, I remember this. I remember this intense body emotion experience. Oh my God, this is fabulous. So you got all that good stuff. But you also have the threatening stuff for most guys, which is when mom was upset with him and he didn't know exactly what to do with it or how to handle it. And he didn't usually continue that intimate relationship with mother. Usually the woman continues the intimate relationship with mother because she doesn't have to separate from her mother in order to, to maintain, to take on a growing, uh, uh, to become an adult female gender identity. A guy really has to separate a little bit. He has to leave the woman's world. He has to go into the man's world. The woman stays with mother all along. She knows when mother's upset with her, it's okay, you can repair it. And when friends are upset, it's okay, you can repair it. The guy doesn't know that. I'm babbling, but you get the picture, right? No, not at all. Not at all. That's very interesting. And it, it's funny hearing you speak. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of discussion. You hear the term daddy issues thrown out at all, a lot. Yes. She's got daddy yes. issues and blah, 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 blah. You know, it's quite common to, to, to talk about that and to hear about that in the culture. I feel like far less attention is paid to the man's typically complicated relationship with mommy. <laughs> Absolutely. Every, every guy has mommy issues because everybody, every guy has, well, it's interesting, straight guy. Every straight guy has this early, early trauma where he has to give up mother's embrace in order to become a man. He has to leave the, the bond of women to some extent in order to become a man. Um, Dan Savage 
who is a, a gay uh, columnist, a well-known uh, sex uh, expert. Um, he says, you know, that's one of the benefits of being gay is because you don't necessarily have to completely give up that bond with your mother. Um, and you can instead maybe identify with her a little bit. Um, you, you're not totally driven to, to, to give up that bond with her, which is scary for, for some guys, but still you see a lot of gay men, they don't necessarily have to give it up in that way. Whereas straight guys usually have to give up the bond with mother to some extent. Yeah. Now they're making a generality and there are a million exceptions, but there's something there. Of course. So mommy issue is very, very big. Yeah, no, absolutely. But get into the mom, one of the reasons you don't hear one of the reasons you don't hear about them is that the early thing was to deny the mommy issue. I don't care what mommy thinks. Well, yeah, mommy, I'm, I'm with daddy. Um, so because the mommy issue has to be denied, you don't hear it talked about very much because guys are still denying it. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that machismo, the male machismo, and all the rest, right? And all that stuff. You know, you Google masculinity these days, and the the most Biggest phrase that pops up is toxic, toxic masculinity. Yes. I mean, men have a hard time these days. No kidding. They don't exactly no kidding. know what they're supposed to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, men, are told that, men are told that they're supposed to be considerate and they're supposed to be not that bad kind of masculinity. You know, that bad thing. We don't want to that bad thing. And then they get in bed with their partner and their partner goes, hmm, now show me the bad boy now. Come on, show me the bad boy. And he goes, wait a minute, I'm totally confused. I thought you didn't want that. No, she goes, yeah, 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 kind of rough me up a little bit. I like that. Throw me around a little bit. He goes, wait a minute, what's going on here? Absolutely. I mean, well, I, as I was reading the book, and the book is called Love Worth Making. It's absolutely excellent. I will, we'll get deeper into it in a moment. But as I was reading the book, I was thinking about this. And one thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, were you, not that the book is particularly controversial or, or um, you know, um, yeah, it's not like it's this screed that's going to provoke a bunch of controversy or anything. Yeah, like I'm, that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Jordan Peterson, but you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you're not. No, terrifying Canadian professors. That's another. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, did did you have any concerns about writing a book about sex in this incredibly charged cultural climate with Me Too and it seems to yeah. me like a bunch of miscommunication between the sexes. Yeah, it's very interesting because because we really have evolved in the past couple of decades. Um, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey sold, I think, 130 million copies by now. I've got to be one of the best-selling books in history. Yeah. Um, and it's about a guy who's really a sexual dominant. Um, and in certain ways, is a kind of a, in real life, he'd be a sexually abuser, a coercive, abusive guy. Um, and this sold 130 million copies. Um, so what's going on? I have a theory about it. I couldn't prove it, and I don't know, but here's my theory about it. At least in America, it was the Obama era. Here was a president who had an egalitarian marriage, who famously required his own anger translator because he didn't express anger very well and didn't seem to have an instinct for dominance. And there was something in the zeitgeist that said, no, nah, no, nah, we need a little sauce here, you know? Um, and then what happens, just as the second Fifty Shades of Grey movie comes out, Donald Trump gets elected president, a guy who is really, he's kind of Christian Grey through a funhouse mirror. He's <laughs> dominant, he's coercive, he's assaultive, he's all that toxic masculinity stuff. Mm. And nobody is interested in Fifty Shades of Grey anymore because you're seeing it on TV every day. Um, nobody wants to see dominance, dominance anymore. So the whole thing shifts. So there's been massive shifts. Um, one of the things I was reacting to in writing the book is that in this era of political correctness, almost all sex books are unisex. I don't know if you know that. Um, they don't really talk about the difference between men and women because the uh, catchphrase now in the 21st century is men and women are more alike than they are different. So that's the big thing. Everybody says men and women are more alike than they are different. And if you say anything else, you're kind of in political trouble. So um, I decided that this was basically garbage because they are different. And I don't know why, you know, you can parse nature versus nurture. I don't really care. But when they walk into my office, they're different. They're really, really, really different. They're two species. Um, when I'm talking to a man, approach is completely different, partially because I, I am a man and partially because they're just different and they, they, they react differently to things. Um, and so 
what I wanted to do in the book is to talk about the differences and to talk about the differences in straight couples and how those differences get people all confused. Some of it we already talked about. So first I talked about the commonalities um, in the first part of the book and how we all have basically imprints from infancy and we want to be enjoyed and we want to regress to that more childish, dumb and happy kind of state of being, which is kind of like the definition of good sex, where you're just in the moment, you don't care about anything else, and you don't care if the phone's ringing or who it is, what they want, you just want them to go away. Um, and we're all alike in that way. But then I get it into the second part of the book, um, which is talking about the differences and the social and cultural and per perhaps innate differences between men and women and how we've kind of developed o over, over the, the millions of years we've been developing as a species. And um, I had many publishers who would not, uh, uh, would not publish the book because of that. Uh, they said it was reinforcing gender stereotypes, which is a no-no these days. So if you talk about differences, you're felt to be reinforcing gender stereotypes. And I said, come on, that's garbage. Um, so uh, finally, we were able to publish the book. And uh, I got some pushback in the progressive community because uh, I talked about differences between men and women. Um, but, you know, I found it was clinically useful in the office, and so I decided to, to keep going with it. But I did do one thing to uh, protect myself, which is every time I wrote a chapter, I would show it to my wife. And she would say, no, you can't say that. And I'd write it again. I'd show it to her. And she'd say, no, 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 no. And I'd write it a third time. I'd say it to her. She goes, okay, okay, you could say that. And that's what we published, the one that she said yes to, which is really interesting because what it means these days, it used to be that men were the authorities in these things. Um, men had the authority. No more. Men don't have the authority anymore. Women have the authority. Women are the final arbiters these days. They're the judge and jury of what's socially acceptable. You don't get labeled socially acceptable unless the women have said it's socially acceptable. It's a big switch. Big switch from 100 years ago. So as a guy, you are um, making your case to the judge and jury, that is to say the women, as to whether you're socially acceptable. So, you know, the French philosopher Michel de Montaigne in the 16th century, he said, I speak the truth not as much as I know, but as much as I dare. And I dare a little bit more as I get older. So I wrote the first book, which was everything, it, it, it had out, did not include anything that my wife didn't approve of. The second book um, is going to have a little bit of what the things that my wife didn't approve of. Um, figure I can walk out on the ice a little bit and we'll see what happens with the second book. The first book it was entitled Love Worth Making. And um, uh, the second book is tentatively entitled Men Worth Keeping. And so it has to do with men and masculinity. And there's no way to talk about masculinity without getting into some of the differences. So the second book, we're going to walk out on the ice a little bit and talk about the things that my wife wouldn't let me put in the first book. Oh, man, I'm excited to read that one. That yeah, sounds... but it's an interesting cultural moment we're in because the, uh, uh, there's a book that came out recently called um, The Unmade Bed uh, by a guy named Stephen March, a very interesting writer on male issues. And it says The Unmade Bed by Stephen March. And then underneath it says, with comments by his wife, Blah, 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 blah. I don't remember her name. Um, and I thought to myself, that is really a sign of the times. For a guy to have his message be acceptable, it has to have been vetted by his wife because the women are the judge and the jury these days. A um, hundred years ago, you know, you could have perhaps seen a book by a woman that said with comments by her husband or with the imprimatur by her husband. You know, that, that conveyed authority in those days. Um, women would write under male pseudonyms those, da these, those days. These days, men get female co-writers to put on in order to protect them from the charge that their voice is just male. I've, I've, given, talk, I've given talks in meetings where, uh, yeah, we should probably actually talk about sex in a minute rather than just talking about masculinity, but um, <laughs> I've given talks in meetings where, as a discussant, where a woman came up, stood up in the back row, said, Dr. Snyder, you are so male. I said, okay, so what do you want? <laughs> you can imagine a man in the back row saying, you're so female. You know, it's like 100 years ago, maybe now, no, it's total flip, totally reversed. No, it's bizarre. I mean, I could go off on a whole tangent. I mean, I've been part yeah. of men's men's groups before, and I've experienced suspicion oh. from women who say 
what do you do in a men's group? Why is it just men? Why is it just like as if we're some secret cabal trying to you know, oppress women or something? I mean, it's, yeah. It's very, very curious. Uh, most men desperately want women's approval. I desperately want women's approval. Most women men do. Um, and uh, yeah, we could get into a whole thing about that. We're not going to talk about it. Let's get back to sex. What should we talk about about sex? Excellent. Well, I was going to, I just wanted to, to highlight some of the particularly arresting statements in the book because there were a number of sentences that really just kind of leapt out at me and they were, they kind of halted me in my tracks. One of them I can't is, wait to hear what they were. Well, one of the big ones is, uh, and it comes very early on, quote, the secrets to great sex in a committed relationship are largely emotional. And yes. quote. And your book is virtually technique free, which I actually found right. very refreshing. Could Thank you comment you. about that statement? Why are the secrets to great sex in a committed relationship largely emotional? Sure. Um, Masters and Johnson um, in the 1950s and 60s made history by really detailing in a scientific way what the changes were that happened to the physical body when a person, male or female, became aroused. Nobody really ever knew before. Nobody ever knew what vaginal lubrication came from. Nobody ever knew what exactly happened to muscle tone and heart rate and all those things when people got excited. After Masters and Johnson, that was all detailed. No one has ever detailed what happens to the sexually aroused mind when people get aroused. To a sex therapist, arousal is the key thing. You solve arousal. You enable couples to get truly excited together, and you're having good sex doesn't even matter if one comes or not or orgasms or whatever. Yeah, that's fine at the end. We to sex therapists, that's just dessert at the end. We want to know, did the person really, really get hot and bothered? So what I set out to do in this book, uh, the reason I wrote the book is I couldn't find it anywhere. So I knew I'd have to do it myself. I spent a couple of decades talking to people and asking them, so what does it feel like when you get aroused? What does it feel like when you get excited? And, you know, I looked at my own experience and people I'd talked to and been with and I decided there were three fundamental aspects to sexual arousal from a psychologically point, psychological point of view. There were things that three things that happened to the sexually aroused mind that made it different from the unaroused mind. The first is it gets drawn in, focused, and absorbed. So you're sexually aroused. The phone rings. You don't give a damn who's calling. You just want them to go away. You don't care what time it is. You don't care what your name is. You're just focused on the immediate experience in the here and now. So that's number one, it's absorption. The second is regression. You become more childlike. As a sex therapist, I like to hear a few giggles. I like to hear people getting a little goofy with each other. They let down their guard a little bit. They're not into deferred gratification because kids aren't into deferred gratification. You know, you may be really into your partner, but you don't want to hear all about their day. You just want them to make nice noises and tell you everything's wonderful. So regression to a more childlike state of mind. That's huge. And the final is what I call validation. You have the feeling of, yeah, 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 that's me. That's me. All the rest of the stuff, that's crap. Um, but this is really where I live. This is really who I am. So you have the feeling. And that's, by the way, that's why uh, gay people can have sex if they want uh, with somebody of the opposite gender. Um, and everything can go okay. They can get hard. They can have a orgasm. But they go, nah, nah, it didn't really hit me. It didn't really feel that feeling of, yeah, yeah, that's the stuff. So those three things, absorption, regression, validation, you put them together and you get a picture of what for most people it's like to be really, really turned on. Unfortunately, few couples pay attention to that. They pay attention to, is he hard? Is she wet? And do we have orgasms? And then let's go to sleep. In the process, they miss that emotional experience. So one of the reasons that I wrote the book is to help couples tune in to what they really need to do in order to get that validating emotional experience. Forget hard, forget wet, yeah, those things are nice, forget orgasms, just get dumb and happy. Those three things, if you could boil it down to essentially, are you dumb and happy? And if you're dumb and happy, chances are it's all going to work well because that's the fuel that the sexual system runs on. So um, in fact, what I tell couples, as I say in the book, it's at the end of chapter five, you don't even have to be having sex. Most people, when they're remembering courtship, what they remember is that they were really excited a lot of the time. They were out to dinner. They were playing footsie. They were dumb and happy. They were getting regressed. They were losing track of time. I have teenage kids. My kids are no longer teenagers. When they were teenagers, they'd show up back home at three in the morning 
And my wife would be frantic. I, well, I'm worried, God forbid, they're dead or something like that. I'd say, no, no, they're just dumb and happy somewhere. I don't know what they're doing, but they lost track of time. And they'd come home at three in the morning. We'd say, where are you? they go, I don't know. I don't know. What happened? I don't know. You know? <laughs> so dumb and happy. And what couples forget once they get into an established relationship is that you can get dumb and happy even if you're not having sex. Unfortunately, most committed couples tend to only get dumb and happy together when they're going to have sex. They go, hey, you want to have sex? You want to have sex? Okay, let's get dumb and happy. It's artificial. It doesn't really work that way. Instead, you should get dumb and happy every day. You should get dumb and happy when you're kissing each other goodbye. I mean, slip a hand under her shirt. I mean, you know, do something so you're losing some IQ points and you lose, you leave for work in a state of mild sexual excitement, just a little buzzed. Now, that's really good stuff for a committed couple. So you get out of this whole binary, we're going to get excited if we're going to have sex, and we're not going to get excited if we're not going to have sex. Get excited all the time. It's fine. In sex therapy, we call this simmering. And it's the simmering that holds couples together even more than the sex. So um, I forget what the question was. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I want oh, the to emotions, talk. the yep. emotions. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, sorry to go off on a rant. No, not at all. Well, actually, you mentioned simmering, and I definitely wanted to get to that in the interview because I love that idea. And I think it's, it's so I, I have a background. I'm really interested in Tantra. I don't know if you have any background or interest in that at all. Um, no, and, no. I, I always, you know, I could never really do Tantra for reasons that I can't tell you in public. But, but no, it, yeah, some, <laughs> yeah, some of us can do Tantra. Some of us can't. Maybe the second or third time I could do a little Tantra, but not the first time. No. Uh, yeah, well, well the, this idea of simmering is very, very in line with a lot of Tantric principles where you're kind of letting this energy build. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about what simmering is. So simmering is cultivating a state of arousal for a minute or two just because it feels good without the requirement to bring yourself to a state of quiescence through orgasm. So your classic example of simmering is a teenage couple, boyfriend and girlfriend, or boyfriend and boyfriend and girlfriend and girlfriend these days, um, boyfriend and girlfriend, let's say, in between class in high school. They have three minutes. So what are they going to do? They meet at one of their lockers. They'll hold each other. He'll inhale the scent of her hair. She'll feel his hands on her. She'll feel there's some energy in his hands, how he's gripping her body. Their bodies will mold together. They'll breathe together. They'll feel each other. They'll kiss passionately. The bell will ring. They'll stop kissing, look each other deep in the eyes, and run off in opposite directions. That's a simmer. And for the next 10 minutes in class, they'll be a little buzzed because they're regressed and validated and absorbed in the whole experience. and They can't pay attention to anything else. That's what you want. The beginning of my book, um, there's a couple in Manhattan on the B train going back from the beach. I'm taking my kids home from the beach. And um, there's this couple standing near the exit and they're sharing an iPod headset and they're simmering. And they're just holding each other and they're fully clothed and they're not doing anything improper. But every adult in the car is watching this couple because the sexual energy of this couple is just so intense. <laughs> it's just filling the entire subway car. That's a good simmer. Um, there's no reason married couples can't do that. Um, instead of anytime you want to kiss your partner, simmer them instead. So instead of kissing your partner good night, simmer them good night and then fall asleep. Instead of kissing them goodbye, simmer them goodbye and then leave for work. Um, and uh, you can simmer anytime you like. All you have to do is know that it's okay. A lot of women that I talk to, even women sex therapists that I talk to, um, think that if you're responsible for getting a man hard, you have to, you have to get him off, which is ridiculous. Um, so they say, oh, I don't want to do anything that's going to get him hard. And I say, you're crazy. We guys, we like being hard. It's nice. Doesn't mean we have to get off every time we're hard. And you do Tantra, so you know this. You know, it doesn't, you know, orgasm is <laughs> do I all over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as you say, it's, if you go in a restaurant, it's dessert. It means, you know, you get the check and you get your coat and you got to hail a cab in Manhattan, you know, it means everything's over. Um, so at least if you're a man, you know, a woman, you, you, it's a little different. Um, so um, the, uh, the simmer is that, uh, is as a woman to know that you can get your man hard and he can be hard and enjoy being hard and you don't have to give him an orgasm. You can go to sleep and he can still be hard and he can have a good time. And so I tell women, even women sex therapists that I talk to, go home, ask your husband about this. And they say, yeah, it was amazing. I never knew that. I thought every time he got hard, he wanted an orgasm. 
Now, obviously, there's some guys who are kind of troglodytes that they feel that way, but most not 21st century guys, they know it's okay. You get an orgasm and go up, it can go down, it can go up and go down, it's all good. Absolutely. Another one of these statements that I have to get to in this interview, I want to make the best use of our time, is, uh, quote, your sexual self never grows up. No matter how old you are, it remains a small child. And I think you go at length in the, in the chapter, Be My Baby, which is titled after one of my, my favorite songs. I love that song. Yeah, a um, great song, the Ronettes. Right, yeah. the Ronettes, absolutely. And that's why, every, that's why every love song has, these love songs have the word baby in it. I never because, made a connection until I read that chapter. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know if the Ronettes made that connection, but it's, it's a real connection because there is something babyish about good sex. So it's a little, actually a little interesting when it gets to masculinity because women get to do the full baby thing. A woman can pout and giggle and all that stuff and do baby talk and everything. And it's a turn on a guy. Well, can't. Daddy, right? Yeah. She could do the daddy thing. A, 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 a woman can do the daddy thing and it's sexy. A man can't do the mommy thing and have it be sexy. There's something there in our deep notions of masculinity. Men are only permitted to regress to a certain degree to a childlike level. A man has to maintain a certain degree of uh, uh, dominant leadership kind of thing so that the woman can surrender to him. The man can't surrender. There's only one time when a man can surrender in bed. You ready? It's the last few seconds before he ejaculates. He can become a total infant. He can become totally helpless and she can feel like he has totally let go in her arms. And most women that I've talked to describe that that is the sweetest moment during sex. It's the moment when he totally surrenders to her and he becomes totally helpless. And she has reduced him to utter helplessness just before he comes. But if he were to do that earlier in lovemaking, chances are she would find it to be a turnoff. So as a guy, there are restrictions. But the overall feeling that sex is infantile and that the sexual self is never more than two years old, that's totally true. And the reason I wrote that is because I see so much garbage out there in the sex literature. For instance, the phrase, let's work on our sexual relationship. And I go, I've been doing this 35 years. I have no idea what that means. How in the world would you ever work on your sexual relationship? Because the sexual mind is like two years old. It has no idea what the word work even means. It doesn't really understand what work is. So I say in the book, you know, if it feels like work, don't do it. You should never be working on your sexual relationship. Instead, you should be regressing, getting absorbed in the experience. You shouldn't actually be caring about your partner too much. That's a key. I talk to men. They say, I say, when you touch her breasts, are you touching her breasts for your pleasure or for hers? And they go, for hers, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to be doing it the right way to turn her on. I go, oh, yeah, 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 this is crazy pants. Um, you're supposed to be doing it for your pleasure. So she knows that her breasts give you pleasure. Now, obviously, you want to be mindful of what you know she likes and doesn't like. And sure, the things that she likes, that's nice to do. But the primary motivation has to be passion because passion is selfish. Passion is infantile. Selfishness is infantile. Infants don't know anything about being generous or giving pleasure. They just know about taking pleasure. And as a parent, one of the secrets of being a parent is to take pleasure from your children in appropriate ways, obviously. For instance, you need to enjoy them. You need to have them bring you joy. Um, you need to be delighted with them. Things that they do should make you happy because they love it when things that they do make you happy. We all love the fact that someone takes joy in the fact that we exist. It's at its simplest in infancy. You know, you see a mother with the baby's feet, you know, and she's kind of biting the feet and you know, enjoying the baby's feet because they're so cute and stubby and everything. And she's not trying to give the baby pleasure. She's just enjoying the baby's feet. And the baby is thrilled because on some nonverbal level, the baby realizes that there's somebody in the universe who takes joy in the fact that they exist. So that's fabulous. And that's the model for all good lovemaking is to take joy in the fact that your partner exists. Unfortunately, almost all sex books talk about pleasuring your partner. One of my favorite sex books, um, I think it probably was his publisher made him do this, is Ian Kerner has this wonderful book. You may have heard about it on Cunnilingus called She Comes First. Great title. Mm. The subtitle is The Thinking Man's Guide to Pleasuring a Woman. She comes first, great title. The Thinking Man's Guide to Pleasuring a Woman is ridiculous because if you read in the book, and Ian says this in the book, he says, before you ever go down on your partner, 
Tell her, listen, this is for me. This is because it turns me on. I'm not doing this to try and turn you on. I'm not doing this to try and do anything to you. If you want to enjoy it, that's fine. I'm doing this because it turns me on. So it should be the thinking man's guide to enjoying a woman. Yeah. So anyway, end of rant, but that's my rant. She Comes First is great. Yeah, great book. Yeah, yeah. despite the subtitle, I'm sure his publisher <laughs> pushed it on him. Absolutely, yeah. So one of my big interests is sexual jealousy. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how couples might use jealousy to their advantage in the bedroom. Yeah, I don't like it. I don't like using jealousy. Uh, in, in the, one of my colleagues, Esther Perel, um, she writes a lot about that, about how there's this aspect of your beloved, which is unknowable to you, including your beloved's feelings and thoughts about other people. And you can use that to motivate you um, to uh, want your partner more because you realize you don't completely have them because we all have this illusion that we completely possess our partners when in actuality, we don't completely possess our partners. I don't like that at all because when it comes to the sexual child, the sexual child does not enjoy jealousy. The sexual child wants security. The sexual child wants to know that that other person thinks you are the universe and loves you for being the universe to them. So I regard that as a cheap trick to force the erotic mind into a state of action. But it, you pay for it later on. You have to keep upping the ante of novelty and tricks. So it's, I don't like anything that forces the erotic mind. So in my chapter on how to do it in a long-term relationship, once you no longer have that new relationship energy to, to, to go on, I say, you wanna go inward. You want to focus in on your own bodily experience. You want to be in your body, be with your emotions, and then turn to your partner and experience your partner for your own interest, your own pleasure. And that's really where the erotic mind lives. And that way you're honoring the, the erotic child in you rather than just kind of trick it into doing something that it doesn't fundamentally want to do. Anyhow, that's a rant too, but uh, you know, obviously I'm very opinionated about this. No, that's very interesting. I'm glad I asked, actually. Yeah, that's, that's a different perspective than I'd heard on this topic. So that's, that's interesting. You, you mentioned see a lot of things. Yeah, go on. No, no, you see a finish, lot of, finish your thought. You, you see a lot of things, a lot of sex advice that has to do with trying to force your erotic mind um, to, into a state. You know, how to make it hot. It shows couples how to make it hot. That's garbage. Um, you know, go out on a date with your, your, your husband or wife, uh, pretend you don't know each other, meet at a bar. That's eh, garbage. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's the equivalent of trying to make a kid happy by buying him a, a, a new novel toy. He's going to play with it for three minutes and then it's going to get thrown into the corner and he's going to want something else. You know, it's 50 shades of gray. Got a lot of American women excited because it was very novel. Got them excited for a week and a half and then nobody reads it anymore. So that's erotic novelty. I'm not into the novelty thing. Yeah. I'm just into like, you know, let's just, Tune in. Let's just tune in. Let's find my erotic child. Where's my erotic child really living? And then let me approach the other person from the state of freshness in the moment of my own erotic child. Yeah. Anyhow, I, I really appreciated your tone throughout the book. I mean, I just heard you saying in various, you know, using various ways to say it, just like relax. Sex is fun. <laughs> <Enjoy>. <laughs> Right. I had, I had one patient of mine. She read the book. She said, you know what the book's all about? I said, what? She goes, it's about, it's going to be okay. And I say this explicitly in the book. I say, you know, this happens when couples lose desire because all couples lose desire at one time or another, usually many, many times over the course of a lifetime together. Um, and the first principle when you lose desire for your partner is not to freak out. Unfortunately, most couples freak out when they lose desire. And they go, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Let's go on a sexy vacation or something. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I can't believe that we're almost at an hour already. I had a bunch more questions that I wanted to ask you. But I mean, one, one thing I really wanted to know was, what is what would you say is the most rewarding part of your job? Like after 30 some years, what still keeps you inspired and motivated and showing up to the office at 8am or whatever you did today? Like, what Yeah, what yeah, no, I could, I, you know, I, I always, I always say, you know, if I didn't have to support my family, I'd do this for free. Um, yeah, it's because, because for me, the most rewarding thing, the sexual self, the sexual mind being infantile, its coping capacities are infantile. It gets easily discouraged. You see this with guys, for instance, their partner's a little dry, they try and enter her, and it's been about 20 seconds and they can't get in, they're gonna go soft because their sexual mind is unhappy because its coping capacities are very, very limited. It gets easily discouraged, just like a small child gets 
discouraged. Sexual problems have that quality for that reason that they make people feel terribly, terribly discouraged about themselves. They make them make people feel hopeless about themselves. I occasionally see guys, occasionally women too, but mostly guys who are even suicidal um, because they lost an erection. And I spent a whole chapter on why is that such a catastrophe for guys? We don't really know. But what I would say is when I see people in the office, I assume that if they're spending all that much money to see me, they're crushed, they're humiliated, and they feel horrible about themselves. They may be very accomplished. They may be wonderful people, but because they're not succeeding in their sexual expectations, they feel horrible about themselves. So for me, the, the truly gratifying thing about the work is to have a person leave my office after an hour, an hour and a half, and feel a sense of hope, feel better about themselves. I mean, that's, I mean you could bottle that. I mean, that's, that's an um, that's a amazing experience to have somebody leave your office and feel better about themselves. Um, just because sex makes people feel so terrible. It's just so nice to have somebody leave the office and says, you think maybe it's going to be okay. <laughs> maybe I'm all right. <laughs> maybe I'm not broken. You know, it's wonderful. Mm. I have a colleague, uh, Emily Nagoski, who wrote a wonderful book for women um, called um, Come As You Are. And she, the reason she wrote this book is she taught a course on women's sexuality at a, a women's college in Massachusetts. And she said she asked for recommendations or evaluations after the course. What did you find valuable about the course? And over half the women in the course wrote back, I learned that I wasn't broken. Everybody out there is thinking they're broken. And some people come into your office, they don't think they're broken anymore. That's an amazing experience. I come home at the end of the, <laughs> end of the day. My wife says, how was the day at work? I go, it was great. <laughs> so anyhow, that's the answer to your question. That's what motivates me. That's great. That's great to hear. So what, where's the number one place people can find you on the web? Um, it's uh, sexualityresource.com. And, uh, and then my book is Love Worth Making. You could go to my book page, loveworthmaking.com, or just on Amazon, Love Worth Making. It's love making with the word worth stuck in the middle. It's the only book I ever wrote, so it'll come right up. It's a yellow book with a couple of uh, sparklers or something on it. Yeah, and it's a tremendous book, so I'd strongly encourage people thank to- you. Uh, Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. it. Nice to talk to you. I, yeah, we've we got we to we talk about Tantra next, and we're going to talk about the Beatles next, and then we'll be done. So Absolutely. Enough, another, another conversation. You're on, Doctor. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Zachary. Take care. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Humans in Love. If you'd like to learn more about my guests, my work, or you'd like to listen to back episodes of the podcast, please visit humansinlove.com. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to Humans in Love using your podcast app of choice. If you're a fan of Humans in Love and you'd like to help keep the show going and help me spread the word, please take 30 seconds out of your day to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast app of choice. Before I let you go, remember that life is short, so let's make it count. And thank you, as always, for your listenership and support. I'll talk to you again very soon. Mm-hmm.